Okay, that's so awesome. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Okay, so now we are live. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I have Rocky Roy here. She is a skin registered dietitian, which is very unique. Hey, and today, so awesome. Oh, I just oh have my to gosh, that's amazing. turn that off. Um, today, we're going to be talking all about the skin gut connection. I'm so, so excited because this is something that I have personally been learning more about and struggling with in my own life. So um, thank you so much for joining us and taking the time. Of course. Thank you, Molly, for having me. Yes. Yeah, so for people who are not familiar with you, would you like to give a little bit of a background on who you are and what you do? Sure. So my name is Rocky Roy. As Molly mentioned, I am a registered dietitian. I go by gut skin nutritionist on Instagram, and that's because I take a gut centered food freedom approach to healing your skin from within. I see clients all over the country, um, ranging from eczema, psoriasis, topical steroid withdrawal. I actually had my own personal experience with eczema and topical steroid withdrawal. And I also have a history of IBS. I always found a connection whenever my IBS went, was really bad, my skin would also flare. That's not always the case with a lot of people, but the gut definitely plays a role in your immune system and it talks to your immune system. And so that's kind of how I how I got into this niche, my own personal story. I actually was an actress before becoming a dietitian. So I did switch careers and now this is my, my passion. Amazing. So I think today is just all, it's gonna be about an introduction to the skin gut connection. So I'd love to start, how is gut health connected to skin health? Yeah, it's, it's such a nuanced and new innovative area of study. There's still so much we have to learn, but we do know that at least 70% of your immune system is in your gut. And your gut is important for metabolizing hormones and making nutrients. And there's just so many nutrients that are responsible in your skin health. And so the research kind of has been showing that, you know, a healthy con gut contains like healthy flora and that can help prevent inflammation. And when one thing is like out of balance, it can definitely have a direct correlation with your skin. And so when it comes to eczema, for example, there are certain strains that they've been studying like lactobacillus or uh, rhamnosus LGG. Uh, it helps with the epithelial um, hydration, so the skin barrier function. So yeah, there's a lot of lot of uh, fun, exciting things coming out there. Mm. And what are some signs that someone may be experiencing skin issues that are related to gut dysbiosis or gut dysfunction? Yeah, so that was really kind of a hard one to answer. We don't have a diagnostic criteria to specifically say like, I can look at your skin and know that there's something going wrong with your, with your gut. Um, but we do know, like if we look at the skin and it looks like there's maybe a fungal infection going on, that could be something like a fungal infection going on in your gut because it can be a fungal rash. So mm -hmm. that can be, um, one sign. Mm -hmm. How often or how common is it to have skin issues if you have IBS? Do you know? We don't definitely, we don't have that number at all, but there's definitely a lot of people who have IBS who also have acne too, um, mm. or, or psoriasis. So it really is, is a toss up, mm. mm -hmm. but we do find that a lot of people will say, you know, once, once my IBS gets better, my skin looks better. So that's like a clue right there. There's definitely a, a connection. Absolutely. And so in your practice or just from, from what you've seen, what are some of the biggest causes to skin imbalance or distress, psoriasis, eczema? Alcohol is a big one. Um, mm -hmm. More so than even diet alone, alcohol. Um, I've seen birth control definitely wreak havoc for skin. Um, stress is a really, really big one as well. If you're really stressed, your skin's going to definitely show it. Mm -hmm. um, and just like lacking nutrient dense foods in your diet as well is, is going to play a huge role. And so that's what I've seen in my practice. And those are all things that can throw the gut off as well. Absolutely. So all, alcohol is like an atomic bomb for, mm -hmm. for the gut. And I have clients who are like, well, I'll have a little bit here and there, but when we're on kind of like a gut restoration protocol, I'm like, we're kind of taking two steps forward 
with some of the supplements maybe we're going with or fiber that we're trying to help with rebuilding, but then we're taking one step backward <laughs> with the alcohol because it really is setting things off, especially if you maybe have a yeast overgrowth, alcohol, especially if it's like a fermented alcohol, that's going to definitely throw off your yeast balance and birth control does the same thing birth control, you can, you can have nutrient deficiencies like B vitamins and B vitamins are metabolized in the gut. So yeah, those are definitely big heavy hitters. Mm -hmm. And I heard you mention fiber and fiber is something that is, I feel like people have a fear of fiber when they have to digestive dysfunction. So can you talk a little bit about the importance of fiber? I know it's personalized to, to everyone. Yeah. IBS is so individual in terms of what amount of fiber and what types of fiber, but how is fiber important, important for skin health? So fiber is especially important because of what it produces. So short chain fatty acids, otherwise known as postbiotics. We always hear about pre, pre, like probiotics, the good bacteria. Some of us have heard of prebiotics, which is food for your bacteria. And then all of, and, and then all of a sudden people have never really heard of short chain fatty acids. They're really what your probiotics produce. So that is actually really important in modulating your immune system is what we found. So mm -hmm. that's why fiber is important. And of course, if you have IBS and you're kind of worried about introducing fibers into your diet, maybe supplementing with a postbiotic or some kind of a short chain fatty acid, course, you want to go to a provider who knows what they're doing. So I actually do have certain situations where I have very, very sensitive clients and we will do some kind of like butyrate supplementation or whatever their needs are um, and go from there. And then they can slowly tolerate um, fibers back into their diet. So that's one way to go about it. Awesome. So I kind of want to get specific about um, eczema and psoriasis. So um, what's the difference between eczema and psoriasis? So with eczema, it appears, well, they both appear like a rash, but I would say eczema probably is kind of more that dry, cracked, red looking skin. And then with psoriasis, it looks more like plaques and the redness and the bumps kind of cluster together. So that's like the main difference. And then with eczema, you can also see classic signs are where it presents itself. So eczema tends to be in the flexures of the skin. So in the, the creases of the elbows, behind the knees, sometimes in the necks and definitely the face, um, it will, it, it will present in, in the hands. Now, uh, psoriasis can be full body. A lot of times I don't really see it too much in the face, but I will see it in the scalp or the base base of the scalp too. So there's different types of psoriasis and there's different types of eczema as well. So there's nuances within each, each diagnosis too, where I think dermatology probably still has not distinguished very well yet. Mm. And I know it's so nuanced, like you mentioned, but if somebody is listening, who's struggling with, we'll start with psoriasis. Do you have any takeaways or tips or things to look out for, for someone struggling from with psoriasis? Yeah. So my recommendations, believe it or not, for eczema and psoriasis are pretty similar when it comes to just having a very low inflammatory diet. Of course, low inflammatory can be different for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, that just means like a lower processed diet for the most part. Now, people who have psoriasis, they are actually on the better end of the spectrum um, when it comes to kind of like food diet sensitivities, they don't actually tend to have that many um, because food allergies and environmental allergies is more comorbid with eczema. So sometimes in a way, some of my psoriasis clients are a little bit easier <laughs> to manage and, and deal with. So, uh, but a big stressor for them is really truly the stress um, and the alcohol piece. Um, skin barrier, um, protection, I think is really important for both, but with psoriasis, especially, I do find that vitamin D or sitting out in the sun really, really does help with their plaques. Mm. Oh, amazing. So do you think it's, it's the sun or the vitamin D? Like if, if they were also going to supplement with vitamin D or is it both? 
So right now, the research does not have a conclusive evidence on which one, um, kind of like a chicken or the egg, which one's going to be better. But I would say just go out in the sun. It's actually just like really beneficial for, for your mood and your overall health to just be out in nature anyways. Mm -hmm. So just getting that in is going to be really important. So yeah, mm -hmm. of course you want to check your vitamin D levels too, because maybe you're just not converting well. Mm -hmm. um, and so of course, going back to the gut health, you can take all the supplements you want in the world, but if you're not absorbing or digesting mm -hmm. properly, like that supplement will go to waste too. So I always like to kind of address the gut health piece first, make sure you really are able to digest and absorb your food, your stress levels low, you're chewing your food, that sort of thing. We don't have any things like maybe robbing your nutrients, like maybe an infection that could be doing um, you more harm. And then we can go in with supplementation if necessary to kind of balance it all together. Hmm. And I feel like when individuals with eczema or psoriasis go to the doctor, sometimes it's not taken as seriously if it's a mild condition. And so when, when should someone reach out to a doctor if they're experiencing these types of issues? Yeah. So that's really, really key. Right. Um, I think a lot of people do end up waiting to go to the doctor when their case is extreme mm -hmm. and then they're frustrated at why their doctor is prescribing them a steroid cream. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I've heard a lot of dermatologists kind of use this analogy and I agree to an extent. It's like, you're trying to put out a, a fire with drops when you need a hose to put out the big fire. So you're going to end up getting some of these like heavy duty medications. And that's what a lot of people don't want to do. Um, so really you don't want to get to a place where you need to see your dermatologist for those instances. If your skin is really, really hot and red and oozing, and it's starting to look yellow and crusting like a honey colored comb color, then that might be a sign of infection, a staph or impetigo, and you definitely must go to the doctor. If you're starting to run a fever or things are getting worse, you might be, ha you might have an infection and your body's trying to fight that off. You definitely need to go to a doctor, but actually in the meantime, for maintenance mode, I really find going to a trained medical esthetician at a med spa to be the most crucial. A lot of people don't know this is like, it's like a secret all of a sudden, like I, found in my own journey before I actually got onto <laughs> this, this call, I just came from my esthetician who just did um, a facial on me. So a lot of, uh, a lot of estheticians are way more trained at customizing your skincare routine for you. So if you can actually maintain your skin while you have like a mild form of eczema or your psoriasis, you won't really need to get to the point where you need to see your dermatologist, right? So that's really key and, and, and important too. And I say go to a, a medical esthetician or someone who does take a holistic approach if that's what you're looking for too, um, because they have at least 1200 hours of training. A lot of people don't know that. It's kind of like similar to uh, a dietitian versus a nutritionist. Anyone can call themselves a nutritionist, but if you go to a dietitian or even a clinical nutrition specialist, they have at least a thousand or 1200 hours under their belt versus just a regular cosmetic esthetician. They might have just 300 hours. So you really want to work with someone who knows how to deal with medical skin conditions. And that's really the key. Um, and then hopefully you don't get to the point where you do need to go to the doctor, but yeah, going to the doctor would be definitely the signs and symptoms would be if your skin's really, really hot, getting worse, oozing, yellow, sign of infection, go to the doctor. That's a huge tip. I think I heard you mention that on a, on a podcast you were on recently, the, the IBS freedom podcast, I think it was. Um, and that I had no idea what a medical esthetician was. And that is sounds really useful for someone who was struggling. So thank yeah, you. And, and that's the thing. A lot of the products that you see out on the store shelves, they are not made for you. They're made for the masses. So it's kind of like MNT medical nutrition therapy. You need to go to someone who can customize things for you. And you're not really going to get that when you go to a regular drugstore, even if the products do have a seal of approval from 
the National Eczema Association or, you know, the National Psoriasis Foundation. Those are definitely important labels to look for. But if, you know, your skin's not getting better after a couple of weeks of being on a product, right, your skin cycles 20 to 40 days, if things are getting worse, then maybe it's time to really seek a professional um, advice and see if they can customize something for you. I actually went to a dermatologist to have them customize skincare for me. And they did not, that was not actually their wheelhouse. Their wheelhouse really is medicine. And yeah, to get your skincare customized, I think going to an esthetician is going to be key there. Mm. So I want to ask you about lifestyle and food, but for while we're on the subject of products and steroids, I want to talk a little bit about steroids. So is it, what is the harm? Like what, I know that there's, there's some negative side effects. So can we talk about that and things to be careful of? Absolutely. So actually you can go to a website, it's called itsan.org as the international topical steroid, um, like withdrawal network. So it actually came about because there was a lot of people who were put on steroids, um, and under the advisement of their doctor too, there is a lot of medical gaslighting that people who are coming off of steroids are facing from doctors saying that it's the patient's fault, that they didn't follow directions. And now they're getting like full body red skin. They look like essentially you look like a burn victim. I actually went through it myself. Um, and I knew it was an eczema because my hair started to fall out. I started to lose my eyelashes and my eyebrows. I was very cold all the time. I, my body had completely stopped um, regulating temperature, but yet it was very, very hot to the touch. It was oozing. I had smell coming out of my pores. It like, it literally smelled like I, my skin was rotting off of me. I was bed bound for months. And so I know for a fact that that is not eczema. A lot of dermatologists will say that that's just severe eczema and let's just give you another steroid cream. And, and that's not the solution. It's kind of like giving a alcoholic who's trying to recover and withdrawing from alcohol, uh, alcohol to function. again. So a lot of times going on some of these steroids, although they can be helpful and we don't understand why some people develop TSW and some people don't, um, it's just the long-term side effects, even after the steroids have cleared out of your body, right? It, it does clear out of your body. It's not like, uh, I know I just used the alcoholic analogy. It's not like alcohol stays in your system. And then once you withdraw your, you know, it's out, it's more so the long-term damage that steroids can do. It thins the skin. Um, it makes the blood vessels kind of leak because the skin is so thin now. Um, and so it also impacts your body's natural ability to produce cortisol because you were relying on synthetic cortisol. So your body in a way kind of became a little lazy and was no longer able to produce it. So then once you kind of withdraw the medication or cease to use it as a better word, really just ceasing to use it. Um, that's where the, you know, sometimes the body does not know what to do in certain situations. And there are certain people on these Facebook groups. If you go to it's and I, I will say trigger warning. The pictures are quite graphic. Um, some people, it takes them a long time to come out of it years. Some people do their bed bound. So that is just one thing to be cautious of. I don't want to scare anybody because my brother also have, has eczema. He did not go through TSW like I did. And to be quite honest, I didn't use steroids for that long. I really just used it on my hands when I was in the hospital. Cause I was just using a lot of, you know, soap to wash my hands and it broke down my skin barrier. We're also seeing people who have come off of immunosuppressants like protopic now who are kind of um, going through this withdrawal. So my theory really is because there's still not a lot of studies is something's happening to the immune system and you really do need to support it. Um, especially when, um, and, and there's definitely research that shows this in psoriasis, um, whenever the body has some kind of infection, it will trigger the psoriasis to come up like a strep throat infection. Mm. So I'm finding with people who have eczema, it doesn't necessarily even need to take an infection. It can just be something very highly stressful. I actually had a client who miscarried her baby and threw her body into a full on blown. It, she thought she was going through mast cell activation syndrome where everything was causing a reaction. So there's something happening. We don't understand what, but there, 
But I do think at least with the topical steroids, it can break down the skin barrier. And so we do need to just be more preventative um, instead of um, trying to use a Band-Aid treatment long-term. Wow. I'm so sorry you had to go through that. That sounds challenging. It makes me a better practitioner. Um, I'm more empathetic and I understand definitely now what my clients are going through when they say they get zingers. I know exactly what they mean. It feels like an electric shock in their body. I've tried to explain that to my dermatologist before. (laughs) They just didn't understand what I was talking about. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. I know. It's, yeah. And it's just it's so interesting that it's so prescribed. Like it, how, how long would you say is a safe amount of time to use a steroid to avoid like that? Withdrawal? So realistically, every single uh, dermatology paper now is saying, you know, you don't want to use it for more than two weeks, but in real life, if I'm being honest, what ends up happening is I've gone on steroids myself. And this is the story I hear over and over from my clients. It's like, okay, my doctor said to use it for two weeks and then we'll taper off. Well, what ends up happening is when they start to taper off, it flares up again. And the doctor puts them back on a higher dose. And it just becomes like this step up ladder until they're just at the maximum dosage and they can't really come down. So the body becomes reliant on it. So right now there's other medications like biologics um, where they turn off certain um, parts of the immune system. Um, And so that might be promising. Again, some people are still not responding. So it's just, it's going to take time, I think, in dermatology, but hopefully we can kind of bring the stories together and kind of work cohesively and hopefully get some research out there. Because skin Mm -hmm. is definitely one of those areas, especially when it comes to eczema and psoriasis that I think needs the most research. I feel like acne might have been researched a little bit more longer. um, So then there's more, you know, modalities and treatments out there. So Mm -hmm. we need to catch up a little bit. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So how can we support our skin health, starting with food, dietary choices? Yeah, absolutely. So you, you just want to choose a, a variety of foods as much as possible. I always say go for 30 different varieties. And that doesn't need to just be food. It can be spices and herbs. Um, I will say, though, certain hot spicy foods will trigger flares. So, you know, go for more of your herbal um, types of spices instead of maybe like a chili powder, chili pepper. And then of course, looking for fiber as much as possible foods that are rich in vitamin A, C, B vitamins, selenium, zinc, omega threes. Those are going to be really important and getting a variety of protein is also going to be really important. Protein is really important for, uh, building skin health. Uh, vitamin C is actually a precursor for collagen synthesis. So that's an important one there too. And just getting enough hydration, you know, at least two and a half to three liters, depending on the person's, you know, height, of course, that might change activity level, but at least two and a half to three liters minimum. Mm -hmm. And any other things like lifestyle products, um, what else can we do to, to support our skin if we have sensitive skin? Yeah, I, um, I always encourage just get out in nature, just ground yourself out in nature lifestyle wise. Don't use too many skincare products. You know, it's actually less is more because you don't know what kind of chemistry experiment you're, you're creating on your mm-hmm. skin. There might be one product that's really safe and it's a serum and one product that's great, that's a cleanser, but they might be from two different brands or lines. And you don't know what that formulation in each product is going to do when it reacts on your skin. So, you know, I know I said it before, but seeing a licensed, you know, medical esthetician is going to be helpful in that area lifestyle wise and seeing a therapist really, if stress is a big trigger for you, we all could use a little bit of, I think, therapy after the shadow work we did last year in 2020. (laughs) Totally, totally for gut issues. Yeah. issues. I totally think a therapist is a really important person on the care team. Um, and so do you have any favorite products for people with eczema or psoriasis? Yes, I do. And it's not really a skincare topical product. It's more like a bath. I love dead sea salt baths. Mm-hmm. They are really, really nourishing 
for the skin. Um, if, if someone can tolerate it, I would say doing four cups in a bath twice a week is really, really great. Um, that's how I actually stopped using topical skincare, to be quite honest. It helped me wean off and yeah, everyone's a little different. It might cause a little bit of itchiness too. So some people might need to switch off between oat baths and Dead Sea salt baths, but I think Dead Sea salt baths are really my, my go-to and one of my favorites. Do you buy the Dead Sea salt somewhere or? Yeah, so Amazon does have them. The brand I like to go for is Minera. And then I think that's the one that's available in North America. I do know in the UK, they don't have that available. I think it's called West Labs. And um, if you're in um, Australia, Bokek. Um, I, have a, I have an international audience, so I've, I've become aware of, of the different brands that are out there. So yeah, I would definitely say you want to dissolve the, the salts first. Um, it might not dissolve right away in your bath, so you might want to heat up some water off on the side in your kitchen and then put it into a warm bath. You never want to enter your bath hot because that will make you itchy and, you know, raise your temperature. So right. that's all the way. One of my favorites. Cool. I love that. And um, a last product question, sunscreen. Do you have any do's and don'ts for sunscreen? <laughs> <laughs> I literally just got a package right now. I'm dying to open it. Do you want me to get that? Yes, oh, yes. I'm unboxing, hold on. <laughs> So I have tried so many sunscreens and I don't like any of them, um, to be quite honest. And a big thing that I guess we didn't talk about is skin conditions and melanated skin. So it presents differently. Everyone's, everyone thinks redness is what appears in the skin, but in melanated skin, it looks quite dark. Um, it can look purplish gray. So you probably can't see my neck, but my, my neck is a different color than my face and my hand. And that's because of post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. So the skin, after it's inflamed, it can actually turn darker in skin that's colored. And so the problem with sunscreen is it usually leaves a white cast. And um, especially in skin that's, that's, uh, that's sensitive, you, want, you don't want to use a chemical sunscreen. You want to use a, a sunscreen that's uh, like zinc oxide, which is more more gentle to the skin, but with zinc oxide, it will leave a white cast. So I actually just found this brand. Again, I have not really tried it yet. I have a sunscreen on my face, which my esthetician put on before I got on this call. I do think I really like it. I have to get the name of it. But this one, um, if anyone is of melanated skin, it's, it's by this brand called Lift Tinted. It's for people who have melanated skin. Of course, it's actually, it's, a, it's for anybody. But the creator is of um, Indian descent. And I'm like, I'm so excited because I just, I literally just opened it right now. Awesome. So this one might be, should I try it on live? Yeah. Do you want me to try it online? <laughs> <laughs> I'll actually put it on my hand. Let's see. So it looks like this, just a tube. And it's coral reef safe, which is one of the reasons why I got it. Oh, beautiful. It's like a peachy color. Oh, wow. I feel like I'm a makeup guru right now. <laughs> so this is what it's starting to look like on my skin. And I actually might be in love with this. I've never had a sunscreen wow. that falls on my skin like this. It usually looks like white paste. Yeah. Wow. That looks great. Yeah, it blended in so quickly. I'm, um, yeah. That's and also, I mean, having hydrated skin helps, of course, too. Yeah. So that's another thing I noticed with sunscreen. It's like, if my skin in the morning is very, very dry, it, I need to do something to like hydrate it, some kind of a face mask or like opening up the skin a little bit from maybe a bath or a shower really helps with putting product on so it doesn't feel like glue. Um, and it's like dragging on my dry skin, but wow, I just, I'm impressed by that. So that's amazing. Do, passion, do I have a favorite sunscreen? Not yet, but this might be, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> do you look for like any specific actives or do you avoid any certain ingredients? Really good question. So right now, because my skin is still on this journey of recovery. Um, I've been probably on this journey of recovery for about a year. Um, 
I, I can tell when I put actives like vitamin C, which is really, really supposed to be great for brightening the skin. Vitamin C for me and a couple of my clients who are really sensitive, um, it's, it's, it's a little too much. So you do want to make sure your skin barrier is thickened up a little bit. Um, and it's definitely not broken and then going for those actives, but yeah, I stay away from salicylic acid and benzoyl peroxide, which is more for acne skin. I don't do a lot of foaming cleansers. I do more of the, uh, the creamy cleansers. So if I have to choose a cleanser right now, I'm, I'm going for CeraVe. Um, but I know there's probably some better ones out there too. Um, just looking for a milk cleanser that doesn't really strip the skin, balances the pH of your skin. So looking for a product like that, it's going to be really important. Mm. And as far as the skin barrier, how can we support a healthy skin barrier? Yeah, so I am, so I don't know if anyone's aware of this, but dietitians are on the skin wound team that's considered high risk patients. So in a clinical um, setting, the dietitian usually sees patients that are high risk like dialysis and tube feeders, but we also see people who have pressure ulcers or bed sores. So working in the nursing homes, I got very acquainted with working with the wound care nurses. I didn't see our wound doctor too much because he would only come once a week. So I would really, um, be in awe how these big crater sized wounds would heal. I'm like, how is this possible? You definitely want to protect the skin as much as you can. So in that setting, they would be on air mattresses. So to relieve pressure off the skin. So what I find with a lot of my clients, because their skin condition does make them very, very itchy, you want to create a physical barrier as much as possible. I do have um, fake nails because it makes a blunt tip. This is something a dermatologist would not really tell you. This yeah. is like living as a patient, things that I discovered that are hacks. And I tell my clients because it does not tear into the skin if you are scratching in the middle of the night. Oh, wow, yeah. yeah you don't scratch or open the skin. So that protects the barrier and it continues to allow it to heal. Now, of course it doesn't take away the itch completely, especially eczema, it's called the, the um, the itch that scratches because the more you itch, the more you scratch because nerve endings are very excited in that area. So I tell a lot of my clients, what I learned really from the nursing homes is um, using Manuka honey. And it's, it's a specific type of Manuka honey. It's medicinal grade. You're not going to really buy it from the store shelves. Like you can, but there's something in the clinical setting we use. It's called Medi honey. It's quite rather sticky though. So I like to use a different brand that's more for commercial grade use. Um, First Honey is one of the brands that I really, really love. And using that over an open area really allows the, the skin to actually heal. A lot of people think you have to air out your skin. Like, you know, uh, you know, they'll say like, oh, like just air it out and it'll heal. But then a couple of weeks later, skin's getting worse. They're coming back and they're saying like, I don't get it. I aired it out. Like, why isn't it healing? Well, really the research from the sixties shows that skin heals faster in a moist environment. And that's because skin heals from the bottom up. When you air it out, you have a scab sitting on top and the new skin cells that are trying to form have to push up against the scab. So really, if you keep it covered, of course, you want to watch out for signs of infection. You don't want it to be a fungal. If there's like a fungal rash, it favors humidity and it'll grow more. So that's where you want to go see a doctor. If you're questioning it, it's like red and oozy. But other than that skin barrier, really, I do find Manuka honey, who would have thought like this holistic practice would be used in a clinical setting. So it's a, it's a medicinal grade tube that they use, but there's also different types of dressings and bandages to use over the area. And that's really how I was able to heal my hands. I had a big hole right here on the base of my thumb. I was able to cover it for about two months and that really helped kind of speed things up because it created the perfect pH balance for the skin to kind of heal and the, um, the skin to epithelialize. So yeah, that's mm. my biggest tip there. That's fascinating. Did you ever find colloidal oatmeal helpful or is that, is that a real like helpful ingredient or is that sort of like a, a fad? 
You know, I personally did not find it helpful, but there's so many clients that say they love it. There's dermatologists that recommend it. Heck, if you look at a lot of the sensitive skincare products, they will put colloidal oatmeal as an active ingredient. So I think it really just comes down to you and your personal preference. I have not found colloidal oatmeal to be, you know, a game changer for me. I do think Manuka honey is a little bit a bigger change for me. But again, everyone's really, really different. Um, another thing I will say, the things that made skin worse for a lot of people, like my clients, I'm seeing on message boards and myself, coconut oil. For psoriasis, coconut oil actually I have found to be helpful, but for eczema and TSW skin, it's not, a, it's a no-go. I think it's too antifungal, antibacterial, and it messes with the pH of the skin. Not mm -hmm. to mention, it's a, it's a saturated fat. It's really going to be hot on the top of your skin. So it's like, you know, imagine putting some kind of Vaseline or Saran Wrap on a burn, on a sunburn. It's just hot and uncomfortable. So I don't like the coconut oil. And they're even showing olive oil is not even recommended. The most close to our sebum pH, um, probably if you're going to go for an oil, would maybe be jojoba oil if that's what you want to try. But yeah, it kind of goes down um, a different rabbit hole. It's really funny. I had a dermatologist, a holistic esthetician, and a medical esthetician, all three of them on my Instagram. So people can check that out. There is an IGTV on my page. You just have to go to it. And I did yes and no, or like toss it or try it kind oh. of game. And so they would hold up their sign when I, um, you know, called out an ingredient. So you can see their responses across the board, of whether or not they liked ingredients or not. I didn't ask about the colloidal oatmeal. I kind of wish I did, but yeah, that's my response. I'll have to go check that out. That's amazing. <laughs> so I want to respect your time. I, one more question, because I think we, we got through everything that people had asked throughout the other questions, but I know that people are wondering, um, about, elimination of foods or foods that may not be as good for these conditions. So can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So elimination diets are a tricky, challenging one. Really elimination diets should not be done for more than two to six weeks, but you should be working with a professional. Um, there's certain foods that maybe you could go longer and eliminate for six months, but I really don't recommend doing that only because you can actually develop an allergy or lose tolerance to that food. True story. Definitely. There was somebody who I know she eliminated dairy for two years and then be she became actually anaphylaxis to the dairy itself. So it can't even be in a product now for her. And that's the unfortunate part. So if you're going to, you know, go on an elimination diet, I would say if you're doing it on your own, you know, probably six weeks. If things are not getting better, but you still do think food is a trigger for you, start maybe working with a dietitian or a clinical nutrition specialist to see if there's maybe like chemical food sensitivities that are underlying. Maybe it's not the food itself. Maybe there's like sulfites that are an issue. Maybe it's nickel, although that's very rare, but it can happen. Or really if it's digestion, I find to be quite honest, and that's why I kind of went with the gut skin approach, I find when we can help with the overall picture of digestion, if we can improve digestion, food intolerances actually do get better. So you are able to better tolerate food too. And there's also another um, thing that people might have not heard of is leaky skin. When you have an impaired skin barrier, food antigens can get through your skin. And that's not what you want to happen because your body might confuse it for a foreign invader, and you might have a reaction to that food. Really, you want to have a closed skin barrier, um, and you want food to be introduced to your immune system through your, your mouth, through your GI tract. Um, so yeah, a lot of times if I can work on the gut, we find that you don't have to go on all these crazy elimination diets at all. Mm. Thank you so much for all this information and sharing your insight with us. If people want to learn more about you, where can they find you? Yeah. So you can find me online, gutskinnutritionist.com, or um, I'm really active on Instagram. I'd love to connect with anybody on there. My Instagram handle is gut.skin.nutritionist. So yeah, thank you so much, Molly, for having me. I can nerd out about this all day long.
This was awesome. Thank you so much, Rocky. I really appreciate it. And I will definitely go check out that, that yes or no IGTV. I'm so excited to check that out. Absolutely. And we have a nutrition one too. There's a part one and a part two. Part two is the sip and chat. So that one's fun with all my nutrition colleagues on there. So we talk about collagen supplementation. I mean, we talk about kombucha or you name it. We do a yes and no for that too. Very cool. Awesome. Well, thanks again. It was so great chatting with you. Likewise. Thanks.